All right. So um, anyway, thanks for coming to class today. <laughs> That's obviously a requirement, um, or at least you're going to get to see the seminar. Um, so this is a presentation that I've had around uh, my lab for a long time. This was actually one of the I don't know when I actually made this presentation, but I made it a long time ago. And um, probably when I was first a professor here, but it really deals with a lot of what I did for my PhD. So I'm gonna try to talk about the thought process that went behind the science. So it's not gonna be just a completely a science presentation, but maybe a little bit of the story behind the story because um, science isn't always a straight line. We talk about the scientific method and you talk about how you know, it's very, it seems like it would be sequential, right? The way we present it, like, well, you make an observation or you see something about the world, you design a hypothesis that you can test. And then you test that hypothesis and then you come up with the results. And then from there you um, devise new hypothesis and then you d develop new experiments and then you get more results like it's this an easy straight line, but it isn't really that way. A lot of your research is going to require troubleshooting and common sense. Hopefully, you have. Hopefully, people have common sense. You got to have common sense in the sense of knowing that something might not have worked in your experiment by paying attention and observing. But you can't be cherry picking your data. But at the same token, you have to have know that all oh, this caterpillar died and it was a random anomaly. So you have to, so there's definitely some thinking going on. But if you have, you know, you have an experiment with 20% of your caterpillars dying for no good reason, you might have to start to think about your results and question them a little bit. If nothing else, you need to acknowledge those kind of things. So all sorts of things I'm trying to say is science isn't always a straight line. And there was a lot of trial and error before I developed a good experimental protocol for this research project I'm talking about. And again, I will, I'll stand up a little bit too, but I wanted to be able to see myself in the camera a little bit. So last week or last meeting, I introduced you to Helicoverpa zea. It's the corn earworm. And this is the most serious pest in the United States. One of the most serious pests in the United States and its cousins are some of the most important pests in the world. Remember, this caterpillar here is a generalist. We talked about that last week, right, everybody? Well, last week, it used to be a once a week class. So last time, last Tuesday, we talked about this caterpillar being a serious pest, right? It, why is that a serious pest? Well, it feeds on our food. We are competing with this insect for that corn out here. It causes billions of dollars of damage and people treat it with billions of dollars. <clears throat> you know, all the different growers or farmers, or, you know, you see the spray planes coming down. That's all in a, an attempt for a variety of reasons. One of them being insect pests, sometimes it's fungi, fungi sometimes it's weeds. All these things are affecting those fields out there. And of course, if we can find ways to reduce um, the chemicals that we use, that would be a good thing, right? If we could reduce the chemicals we use, let me see if I can raise the camera a little bit. If we can reduce the chemicals we use and do so without, um, you know, affecting ourselves, I was trying to move that camera, that would be a good thing. So unfortunately, pesticides are kind of a necessary evil a little bit. And so here is um, Helioverpa zea. And you can see that here's the corn earworm caterpillar. Um, you can see its head up here. It's laying on some silk. And then you guys remember, when I say guys, I mean generically. And then what are those holes? Spiracles, good. And what are spiracles? They're a little they breathe. Yeah, they breathe through them, the little holes that open up in the body. And again, this is a generalist caterpillar. What does that mean? It feeds on a wide range of plants, corn plants, tobacco plants, cotton plants, tomato plants. More uh, uh, feeds on cannabis, feeds on all sorts of stuff. So it's really important. 
is a pest. And, if, and in the United States, it's called Heliobarpa zea. It also might be found in the literature as Heliothus zea. Just realized that they changed the name to Heliobarpa zea probably a decade ago or so. Um, we also have Heliobarpa armigera, which is also the kissing cousin of this caterpillar, where it's a serious pest in Europe and Asia and Africa. So again, what I was charged to do as a grad student working on my PhD, so one of the things you got to do is find a research advisor. You might come up with some of your own research ideas, but you're also going to be working in the context of what they do in their lab normally. And so my advisor there was interested in this caterpillar and its salivary factors and how it might affect plant defenses. So that was what my, I had to do for my PhD, or I agreed to do for my PhD dissertation, um, was to begin to investigate what this saliva might do to plant defenses. They discovered it before I got there, and then I had to try to figure out some functions for it. So the question is, how do you figure out functions of saliva? But I'll start thinking, what would be the way you'd start to think about the functions of saliva? and coming up with hypothesis. We found there was an enzyme before we got to called glucose oxidase. It was found in the salivary glands. It, uh, we know that it breaks down glucose and makes hydrogen peroxide and gluconic acid. But what would be some of the functions of saliva? Where would you start to think about that? How would you, would, how would you make an observation? Well, what does saliva do for you? It might be just the first thought. It has moisture. Yep, keeps your mouth parts nice and, and wet. What else? Breaking down our food. Helps break down our food. Good one. Um, these insects are going to extra orally secrete spit, which may help to digest the food. So that might be one of the functions. What else? We already talked about the fact that we know that moths lay silk to make silk that you can wear. Um, no, this isn't silk. <laughs> this isn't silk. <laughs> uh, but anyway, but you know what I'm saying? Some people have fancy silk scarves and stuff, right? So that's another thing. Um, they, the silk can be used to help the little caterpillars float away or spiders to float away. So, so you just start to think about some of the practical things. We know, so, we know our spit helps us in digestion, like you mentioned. It might help us to avoid germs. Maybe it helps break down germs a little bit, help prevent cavities. So you start to think about all those kind of possibilities. So in my case, though, I was interested in induced defenses, and I'm going to get into more about that. But do you remember what an induced defense is? Talked about last time. What's an induced defense? It occurs like after damage. Right, good. So when a plant is damaged, it stimulates plant defenses. It's almost what well, you think of it as like an immune system. Plants don't have an immune system, but it's an immune like system. So when the plant is being attacked, it's going to turn on a variety of plant defenses that help protect it from the insect or from the pathogen or so forth after the damage has occurred. What is constitutive defenses? Do you remember that? Always present. Yeah, very good, always present. So I'm interested in what, ha what happens to induced defenses. And so, here's spit. But what's how spit different than saliva? How do you get to it? Well, uh, let me turn from that picture a little bit. These are two caterpillars up here. On the uh, left, you'll see these are the mandibles of a caterpillar. Pierce three pieces caterpillar. You can see the mandibles, and then you'll see a little bit of a cone-like spinneret. On it is a little droplet of spit. 
There's also saliva that can be found in the mandibles called mandibular spit. So how do you get at this if you want to do an experiment? That's the things I had to figure out from my dissertation. Now, what some researchers have done in the past was they basically grab a caterpillar and squeeze it, causing it to upchuck. So that's basically throw up, caterpillar throw up. They like to call it regurgitant. Um, to me, regurgitant is something that's like the cows do where they regurgitate their food, their cud, and sit there chewing on it and then swallow it again. But this isn't something that they necessarily chose to do. Now, there might be a little bit of regurgitant, there might be a little bit of throw up that caterpillars do, but this was actually forced by the researchers where they squeezed the caterpillar. So what are some of the problems with this, you think, in comparison to looking at spit? You get like different components or enzymes. Good job. So yeah, you would get some stuff from the gut. You also might get the plant food itself that's been digested. So there might be chemical signals in the leaves that were chewed on. Because remember when a plant is being chewed on, you're wounding it and there's wounding signals in the plant it's also being found in the regurgitant. So if I collected this up with a little suction pipette and then wounded the plants and painted it on, we talked about this a little bit how I did my experiment, that might give me a different result than if I just looked at the slime itself. So it'd be good to get it in an experimental way to um, look at saliva specifically. And I gave you some ideas about how I did that already. But first, let's talk about the salivary glands and what they look like. So this is a caterpillar that's been dissected. Here's its head, and then here's its body. Well, excuse me, whole thing's its body, but here's its gut and mid-gut, then hind gut down here. The rest of the caterpillar's body would actually go below this slide. And so what you see here are the labial salivary glands, which are really huge. These big structures on the sides. That's where the labial saliva is. And then in the middle, you can see the mandibular salivary glands, much smaller. So if I dissected you, the salivary glands will go from your neck down to your, your knees, as, I, as you recall me telling about. Now you can see them. So the first thing I would do, or one of the things we did is we would collect these salivary glands, grind them up, and then we could paint them onto wounded leaves. You might recall me talking about that on Tuesday, right? So again, insect saliva probably has numerous functions. Some of it's keep the mouth parts clean. Some of it's form silk and help them balloon away. Some of them is help them to digest the food that they're eating. Believe it or not, though, that some of these secretions might not be so beneficial to the insect. Did you know that when a plant is being fed on by an insect and the spit is being put on the insect, or excuse me, the spit's being put onto the plant, at those wound sites when it's chewing, that the spit can actually turn on what we call volatiles in the plant. So when the plant's being fed on, it's being chewed on and being spit on, the plant releases these volatiles. Does anybody know what a volatile is? If, I'm sure you're guessing it's a gassy substance of some sort. If you've ever smelled fresh mowed lawn, like, you know, lawn, lawn grass smells like it's been cut. That's volatiles coming from the lawn. That's wounded response. Well, anyway, when a plant, maybe like a tobacco plant has been wounded, the volatiles will leave where the caterpillar fed, waft into the air, and can actually attract parasitic wasps. We call those parasitoids. Parasites typically like what we might have in our bodies, like a tapeworm don't necessarily kill you. Those are parasites. Parasitoids always, almost always kill the, the, the host. So usually they're little small parasitic wasps, but they look like little gnats to you sometimes. You wouldn't know they were wasps unless you looked at a magnifying glass or taking a, an entomology class or something like that. They'll fly to that plant. The plant's basically releasing this volatile signal an SOS signal, help, I'm being eaten. That signal is attracted to the parasitic wasp that will fly in, find the caterpillar, 
sting the caterpillar and then lay its eggs inside the caterpillar, essentially um, killing the caterpillar because the larvae will grow in and just like in the movie um, Alien, if you've ever seen that movie, the alien pops out of the guy's chest and the, the sci-fi sci horror movie, probably some of you 50-50 might have seen it. Very popular in the 70s. Anyway, it'll pop out of their chest and run around. Sigourney Weaver was in it. A badass chick that was fighting an alien or surviving anyway when everybody else died. Anyway, um, that's what the parasitic wasp do. They'll sting that caterpillar, lay the eggs in it, and the caterpillar just keeps eating and becomes basically a host to multiple parasitic wasps that will then pop out and go find another caterpillar to sting. So that may not be necessarily a positive function, but that is a factor that the SIBO sometimes do, does. But I'm trying to figure out what does glucose oxidase do for this caterpillar? Is it beneficial? Is it not beneficial? Why is it making so much of this enzyme? It's about 50% of the enzyme in the saliva is glucose oxidase. So that was my job to figure out as a PhD student. Now, one thing else to think about insect spit is it actually has another function, helps them to get a meal. Now, in snakes, their spit's pretty important. If they bite you, um, it can be very harmful if it's a poisonous snake, right? But that poison is meant to knock out like a, a rat or something like that immediately, and then they can swallow it without being damaged. So they have very, some snakes have very strong um, poisons to help them get a meal. Mosquitoes have factors in their saliva to help them to get a meal. So they'll bite you, the females do, not the males. Actually, it's only female mosquitoes that bite. They need the blood for their, their uh, egg round. So when a uh, female mosquito bites you, um, she'll lay some spit in you, and that will cause your capillaries to vasodilate so that they can get a blood meal. And it tries to suppress your immune system temporarily. And they do it in such a way that they can cleverly fly away without you noticing, hopefully. Um, doesn't always work out for them, of course. So my point, though, is that saliva also has an important role of tricking the immune system of animals. But what about caterpillars tricking the immune system of plants? Is that possible? That's the kind of questions I had to ask, or I wanted to ask when I was working on my PhD. So again, what is glucose oxidase? It's an enzyme found in this caterpillar, Heliobirpus zea, and a wide range of other caterpillars that breaks down glucose into hydrogen peroxide and gluconic acid. So that's the function. Anytime you see the word ACE, you know it's an enzyme, right? The glucose oxidase. It makes up about 50% of the proteins found in the slime of caterpillars. Again, it converts glucose with oxygen and water into gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide. So they got me thinking a little bit about hydrogen peroxide. Could hydrogen peroxide have some kind of function for the caterpillar? So then you start thinking about what does hydrogen peroxide do? Well, we know that hydrogen peroxide is sometimes used to clean our own wounds, right? It's antibacterial, so that might have a function. Did you know that honeybees actually use glucose oxidase to help protect their honey? So they'll actually put glucose oxidase into the honey to help kill the bacteria in addition to the high sugar levels. So maybe that's an important function too for these caterpillars. But now it's time to talk a little bit about plant defenses. Um, plant defenses, again, are kind of like an immune-like response in plants. Now, when I say immune-like, remember in humans and, and other animals, we have antibodies that attach to antigens. And then that's our way of um, forming proteins that can find foreign invaders and, and hopefully kill them before they kill you, right? That makes sense, really. So hopefully, when you've been, you know, you got ill, 
if the virus hasn't evolved too much, you'll be able to protect yourself from that virus again in the future. But remember, viruses can evolve uh, things like that too. So that's why one of the reasons why the antibodies don't have to be changed, you know, the animals, the vaccines have to be changed because the virus is constantly changing. Or viruses. Or, um, so you know how you have hormones in your body? Hormones are chemicals that run around in your body to stimulate, you know, glands, you know, test off and causes your my hair to go on my face, right? Estrogen does things. Everybody has a little bit of a mixture of these two hormones. There's a lot of other hormones as well. Well, in plants, they have hormones too. Um, some hormones are called jasminates. This is universal among plants. Even can be found in some algae. Or salicylate or salicylic acid. So jasminate or jasmonic acid. This is a jasmonic acid. And then salicylic acid, or we also call it salicylate. Um, these are two important plant hormones that are involved in plant defenses. Um, jasminates were actually discovered in um, jasmine, like jasmine tea and stuff like that. It's a chemical that actually stimulates the plant's anti-herbivore defenses and wound responses. That's this pathway over here. And that's under what we call induced resistance. Induced resistance. Does that make sense to everybody so far? So again, if a plant is wounded or there's a delivery that takes place, there'll be chemical pathway that'll, and again, this is a complex chemical pathway, lots of steps that are shown that result in the formation of jasminate and then ultimately goes and forms plant defenses. If it was tobacco plant, what do you think to what do you think jasmine would stimulate down downstream? What do we know about tobacco plants? What do they make? Starts with an N. Nicotine. nicotine. Jasmine would stimulate nicotine in tobacco plants. Nicotine is a poison that tobacco plants make to protect themselves from herbivores. So that hormone jasmineate would stimulate the formation of nicotine. Okay. There's other plant defenses you're gonna learn about too, such as protease inhibitors. Protease inhibitors is a protein that blocks the caterpillar's proteases from digesting protein. I don't know if you realize this, but in your body, you have enzymes called proteases. So when you're eating your burger tonight or veggie burger or whatever, Make a protein, you're going to have enzymes called proteases that are going to help break it down. Pepsin, trypsin, chymotrypsin, yada, yada, yada. Insects have trypsin and chymotrypsin too. And so plants can actually make chemicals that block the trypsin from working. They can block the caterpillar's ability to digest trypsin, and they can even block your body. You can't eat raw soybeans and be healthy. You have to cook soybeans, for instance, to destroy the protease inhibitors. So there's so some plants you can't eat like beans without cooking them, and be, you know to be healthy because of those plant defenses. <clears throat> now there's another set of defenses called the systemic acquired resistance pathway. So again, not to confuse with the induced resistance pathway, the systemic acquired resistance pathway or the SAR, and of course this is called IR, the SAR pathway or the system acquired resistance pathway is a pathway that's primarily stimulated by plant pathogens. Okay. And so, so if a plant was attacked by a virus, the system required resistance pathway is primarily going to be turned on, or bacteria. And in some cases, some insects like aphids might turn on this pathway. Well, caterpillars typically turn on this pathway. Okay. Now, 
notice something on this pathway that's important. Hydrogen peroxide's on this pathway. So that's kind of peculiar because caterpillars have an enzyme that can make hydrogen peroxide. So maybe we'll get to this in a minute, but maybe the plant is being tricked into thinking of, of itself as a, being attacked by a pathogen when this caterpillar is feeding and spitting on it. That's a hypothesis I had anyway. <clears throat> the hormone that's made is salicylate. Does anybody ever use salicylate in here? Or acetyl salicylate? Does anybody think they've ever taken it before? Well, this is basically aspirin. Acetyl salicylic acid is aspirin. So the plant is, has a hormone, salicylic acid, that's important against diseases. So these hormones that are in plants do have an effect on you also, right? Anti-inflammatory, painkiller, fever reducer. It was discovered, I think, in um, Selix trees, the trees with a white barky. Can't quite pronounce it anyway, but it's, you can find out more further north than us usually. Anyway, it would then trigger a variety of plant pathogen defenses. Now, let me get back to this a little bit more because you notice there's a thing that says crosstalk in the middle. Apparently, these two hormone pathways interact with each other in such a way that they affect each other. What I mean is if this uh, jasmine pathway is really stimulated high and high amounts, it typically lowers the salicylic acid levels. And, and vice versa. If this pathway is stimulated highly, this pathway tends to be suppressed. And so you remember a plant is dealing with a variety of pest problems out there. It could be funguses, it could be bacteria, it could be a variety of different types of insect herbivores, it could be big animals, big herbivores. So they have all these hormones kind of dealing with everything. Even your own hormones are interacting with one another, right? So again, the interesting thing that got us thinking about this was here's a caterpillar that makes an enzyme that seems to possibly trigger this pathway. If it triggers this pathway, maybe it'll help suppress the plant defenses. That was what I needed to test for my PhD. So I'm gonna give you, that's the background story. So a lot of people have discovered this kind of basic background hormone things. And then we find out there's a caterpillar that makes this enzyme. And so now we're going to go test it and see if it really does that to plant defenses. It could be other functions too, but that was one of the things we wanted to test. So again, hydrogen peroxide is a systemic signal of plant pathogen defenses. And plant pathogen defenses can suppress inducible plant defenses and reducible resistance. So in other words, I'll go back to this. This hydrogen peroxide can stimulate salicylic acid and suppress this. If we're talking about tobacco plants again, if we suppress jasmine, we suppress nicotine, right? Everybody remember nicotine is an insecticide in tobacco plants. It's not just meant for you to smoke and Relax or something. A little uh, hand, believe it or not, it doesn't take much nicotine to stop your heart. Anybody ever watched this movie, Thanks for Smoking? It was a really good movie. Anyway, it was about this guy that was um, supportive of the tobacco industry. And then one of the anti smokers kidnapped him and started putting nicotine patches all over his body and was going to kill him. 
luckily he had such a resistance from all the smoking he did that he could survive it. But <laughs> it's a funny movie, but anyway. Um, yeah, nicotine, it doesn't take much. You could, if I, I had enough nicotine in a little vial or you drank it, you would die. Yeah. I'm surprised how strong tobacco is. I didn't do a lot. I did a little bit of chew in the military. And the first time I tried, I was like, oh, my head was spinning. I couldn't believe how strong it is. Um, anyway, so my point though is nicotine is insecticide. The jasmine pathway, the caterpillar is wounding that plant. It should be stimulating nicotine. And maybe there's some factors in their spit that might help to reduce that stimulation. So I had to get out, figure out a way to prevent these caterpillars from spitting. And so this is the side profile of its head. Isn't that really cute? Here you got your mandibles, you got your little legs. And then this is the spinneret. That's the cone-like structure that I had to figure out a way to stop it from spitting. So that's my job, right? I don't get to get to graduate. I don't get to have a PhD and all that stuff. So I had to figure out ways to stop from spitting. I already talked about some ways. What would you? What were some of the ways I talked about? Or how would you try to stop it if you don't remember? I tried super glue, didn't work. Um, you could cut it off. Um, of course, it doesn't leave a bigger hole. But the next time they molted, they wouldn't have a spinneret. I tried hot wax. <laughs> I got kinky trying hot wax. It didn't work. Um, so <clears throat> what I did was I took a hot um, probe, you know, like you see in my section room, put it on a Bunsen burner or something like that, you know, real nice and red hot, and basically branded it by mangling this down. And it can no longer spit from that hole, from that spinneret. And then for the control treatments, I would just kind of burn them over here a little bit. This could be on a figure. Remember, you probably treat everything the same way in the control and the treatment, right? All right. So here's what it looks like. You get the intact spinneret, and then the mangled or burnt spinneret. And then how do I know if it actually worked? Maybe they could still secrete spit out of this. Maybe there's still a little hole there that I can't see. So what I did was I put the caterpillars on a glass fiber disc. So they're about, this is about the size of a quarter containing sucrose and glucose. Now remember glucose, the caterpillar spit would interact with the make hydrogen peroxide. And then we can stain the hydrogen peroxide. There's a stain called dab stain. I forgot the chemical name completely, but when you stain it, the disc will turn brown. Why did I put sucrose on there? It makes the glass fiber disc taste better to the caterpillar. You know, you put some sugar on a glass fiber disc, I'd probably eat it. So anyway, um, this is the <clears throat> this is the damage from the feeding. You see the spaces and the holes. If the spinneret was cauterized and burnt properly, you'll notice that it didn't really make it too brown. But if I cauterized the spinneret, or excuse me, and the cat, excuse me, make sure back up. If the cat, if the spinneret was intact, completely there, the disc turned brown, hard brown. You see that? Because they're able to spit on it. And then that spit would interact with glucose and make hydrogen peroxide, and then we'd see the browning from the hydrogen, from the stain. Okay, does that make sense already? But if I cauterize it, it's not nearly as brown. See, look at look at that. So there is a difference. So now I have caterpillars, and they can spit a lot, and caterpillars they couldn't. Then I could put them on tobacco plant and measure um, the amount of nicotine that is formed. So what would my hypothesis say? Which one of these should stimulate more nicotine? The intact spinneret or the ablated spinneret or cauterized spinneret? When I say ablated, I mean cauterized. Okay. 
Well, think about that for a second now. So if we go back to our argument, in tax spinnerets decrease the life that has high levels of glucose oxidase. The high levels of glucose oxidase has high levels of hydrogen peroxide. And then the hydrogen peroxide stimulates, um, let's go back, stimulates the plant pathogen responses. And the plant pathogen responses and cell out cells of the acid, high levels of that should suppress jasmine and maybe reduce the amount of nicotine. So the idea is intact salivary glands, intact spit, intact spinnerets will stimulate more of this. And the cauterize should stimulate more of that. Does that make a little more sense? Yeah. Okay. And that's because the spit makes this. Does that make sense, everybody? So that's the hypothesis. We don't know what's going to happen yet, though. But that's what that's the hypothesis that we came up with. All right. So the other thing I developed that you will remember from Tuesday is I also developed a surgery where I removed the salivary glands and caterpillars. <clears throat> Just quickly recap. Um, I threw the caterpillars in ice water, knocked them out, put them under a dissecting, on a dissecting dish with water, found the labeled salivary glands and yanked them out. And I had caterpillars with salivary glands and without salivary glands. I better call that. No, I wanted to recap for Tuesday. So that's, so we got to have, I have this surgery I invented. And then after I pull the salivary glands out, I can pinch them and they heal. A caterpillar live and without salivary glands. And that's kind of like the burnt versus the not burnt. So if they have the salivary glands removed, they're like cauterized. Does that make sense, everybody? So there's just two different methods of getting at the same idea. And the same result happens. If they have their salivary glands present, the disc fibers are brown from the stain, from the hydrogen peroxide. If the salivary glands are removed, they're not brown. Then I can put them on tobacco plants. Why did we use tobacco plants? It wasn't necessarily that we're interested in the tobacco industry. It's because um, we had a good idea about the biochemical pathways. They've been studied pretty reasonably. So that was one of the reasons. And we knew this caterpillar could feed on them because it's a generalist. It's not its ideal host, but it can feed on them. So my objective for my PhD was to determine what role this salivary enzyme might have on the inducible defenses of plants and particularly tobacco plants. And then secondarily, we'll talk about this later, maybe has some function for bacterial pathogens that the caterpillar might be, but that's a side note for now. So again, a hypothesis is a statement that you can test. So when you do your research, you have to develop a hypothesis that you can test it. So it's a statement, a yes and no statement almost, or essentially. So my hypothesis was caterpillar saliva will suppress the inducible herbivore defenses of tobacco plants, specifically nicotine. So it'll suppress the, form, the induction of nicotine. Is everybody following it? So I would expect lower levels of nicotine for caterpillars with intact spinnerets or with salivary glands. And if the cell systemic acquired resistance pathway is being turned on, I expect to see higher levels of pathogen resistant genes being simulated by the hydrogen peroxide. Everybody follow along, okay? Guys, glazing over yet? Let's get through at least another slide or two, then we'll take a break. So, I wanted to compare the suppression of inducible plant defenses in tobacco 
by Helicobur bazea, those caterpillars that can secrete saliva versus those with a hindered ability. And then measure the nicotine levels. And then what does that mean for the survival of caterpillars? Does anybody recognize that guy? <laughs> does that laugh mean you probably know who he is? Yeah. <laughs> Do I look different now? Look the same. Same. The same. I look younger now. <laughs> so anyway, that's me on my working on a PhD, and um, this is at the University of Arkansas. That's where I did my PhD. And here's a bunch of tobacco plants. We randomized them in a greenhouse. Some, these are clip cages, they're petri dishes, but they're for the purpose of, of this experiment, we put some foam around them on the edges. So when cut into the leaf, I punch some holes in it, um, try to make the ambient air the same. And then I had a caterpillar to clear out the leaf. And then I measure, I measure nicotine in the remaining portion of the leaf. Okay. So, again, it's either caterpillars that can spit or can't spit, or non wounded plants, depending on the experiment I did. This was after what I think one day of feeding and then three days of let the nicotine levels increase, because it takes a few days for induction to take place. And so this is what our results show. This, um, in case this is something you should be aware of, is how do you read a chart? Some of the, I noticed some things are a little bit out of place because this was done in PowerPoint and it's being shown on Google Slides or whatever. So some things aren't exactly where they're supposed to be, like this should be up a little higher. And, you know, some of the gaps, I think, are messed up because of the changing between different systems but anyway so you should understand how to read a chart that's an important skill if you don't already know how to do so remember this is called the y-axis on the left so that tells you the milligrams of nicotine per gram of leaf material that's how i measured it and then these this is the x-axis which tells you the treatments so think of the x-axis as the explanatory. Does that make sense, everybody? And the y-axis is the response. So caterpillars without salivary glands stimulated nicotine higher than caterpillars with salivary glands. So quite a bit, probably about 50% lower, isn't it? And the non-wounded is the lowest still. So that means even when the caterpillars had a little bit of a salivary gland, there was at least a little bit of nicotine increasing, but we didn't see a significant difference. The letters tell you whether or not these are significantly different. So if A is, is a different letter than B, we know that there, those two bars are significantly different. These two bars have the same letter B, so they're the same, statistically speaking. Now, if I had more treatments, these probably would have become statistically different too. N would represent the number of replicates. I had six replicates. And this was the statistical test we used. It was an ANOVA followed by a Fisher's least significant difference test. And so we know that the probability is less than 0 0.05 for these two treatments. So that means I can say that caterpillars without salivary glands, those tobacco plants have significantly more nicotine than caterpillars with salivary glands. Does that make sense? I can say significant. When you say it's significant, that means it's statistically been tested. The other thing I want you to be aware of is this is the mean. So these are all, these bar graphs are the means of multiple replicates I measured. And then these are what we call standard error bars of the mean. So those bars don't overlap. That usually means that they're statistically different. So if you ever do it, if you don't have a lot of statistical know-how, but you get the means and you get the standard errors, you and if the standard error bars don't overlap, it means that you probably have something that's significant statistically before you even do the statistical test. This is the standard error bar. And this means that the mean is somewhere in the middle of that. Does that make sense to everybody playing at home? 
see that? So that's the mean, that's the standard error bar. So these standard error bars are not overlapping. So this one is statistically significant in comparison to those. So that was with or without salivary glands, that's the surgery. What about that cauterized spinneret? You see the same thing. If you cauterize the spinneret, there's significantly higher amounts of nicotine in those tobacco leaves that were fed on by caterpillars with cauterized spinnerets than normal spinnerets. <clears throat> Nicotine's bad for the caterpillars, by the way. So what we found is that we put neonates onto these treatments, the neonates, meaning the fresh born caterpillars, um, died at a higher rate when they fed on cauterized spinnerets. So this is a good place to give you a 10 minute rest. Does that sound good? So we're gonna pause it for a moment and then we'll start up again at 5.05. So my beard definitely is darker there. <laughs> my hair is still pretty, I'm pretty, got a lot of hair still, which is good, right? I'm 52. I know I look like I'm 42, right? 32. I started here when I was 32. So this is my 20th year, actually. And uh, anyway, this is a caterpillar. Now, we stained the labial glands to look blue here. They're not really blue. And you'll get to dissect some caterpillars in this class, too. Um, and then what I did was I purified the glucose oxidase out of the salivary glands by using this machine that I have in my lab that could be used again. I did this in Arkansas and then bought the similar machine here. It uses kind of electrophoresis technology to purify the protein in about 20 times to 40 times what it's found in the salivary glands. So Basically, what I'm trying to tell you is I dissected hundreds of caterpillars and purified glucose oxidase out of the out of the salivary gland extracts. Okay, because what I'm trying to get at is is glucose oxidase important for these plant defenses? We know that you know. Did I prove that glucose oxidase did anything at that moment, or did I just show that spit does something? And that, in that experiment, I just showed spit did something. Now we want to get at whether or not glucose oxidase is important. So what I did was I purified the glucose oxidase from the salivary glands. Then if you remember from last week, we'll punch holes into leaves to simulate being a caterpillar. So here's the assay. You can see that it's brown. So those, those are the wells that had glucose oxidase in it. So you can see it's relatively purified and then these ones they didn't have it so then I would know it's been a while since I've done it but I would know which parts of this column or samples would be you know have glucose oxidase and then I combine them I used to stay up all night doing that one of the things I like doing when I was at University of Arkansas is I also developed a summer class for high school students through their upward bound program. So we would do real research projects. And so it was a nice way to get a lot of extra hands to help me dissect hundreds, if not thousands of caterpillars. And so they seemed like they enjoyed it the first day <laughs> and then I had child sla <laughs> sla a little slavery going on. But, um, and then the funny thing is all these kids are now are, are much older than you all. That's how long ago it's been. So these, these are probably, gosh, they gotta be in the forties, right? So, or thir late thirties anyway. And so here I am punching holes into leaves and painting them with caterpillar spit. So here's the four treatments we had. We had non-wounded tobacco plants. We wounded them by punching a hole in them and painting on salivary gland extracts or glucose oxidase. GOX is glucose oxidase. Autoclave glucose oxidase. Why do you think I autoclaved it? 
Well, if you autoclave it, it, it destroys the protein. So an active glucose oxidase and inactive glucose oxidase. Does that make sense, everybody? And then water. So these are my four treatments. So these are kind of like my positive treatments, and these are my you know, negative treatments. These would be like the ablated treatments. Does that make sense, everybody? And then I did another experiment that I'll explain later where I removed the cell, cell and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But anyway, after I wounded the plants, I'd paint them with these different factors. Now, it looks like I just punched one hole in it, but eventually I realized to really stimulate some nicotine in these tobacco leaves, it's, it's useful to put about four or five, six holes in them. So I had to put more holes in them eventually, not just one. But every time I put a hole in it, I painted it either with celery gland extracts, glucose oxidase, autoclave glucose oxidase, or water. And we used the same amounts of protein for each of these. In case, of course, water didn't have protein in it, but to speak of. And then here I am showing the students how to punch holes into it. Um, so they had a good time learning. And so here's what we found out. So again, this is the y-axis. This is the milligrams of nicotine per gram of leaf. And we see that if you punch holes into a leaf and paint it with water, the nicotine levels are higher than if you punch the holes and paint salivary gland extract. See that? Or inactive glucose oxidase where I've autoclaved it, destroyed it, its levels of nicotine are equally high to the water treatment. But if, if glucose oxidase is active and present, then it lowers the nicotine levels. So this is demonstrating that glucose oxidase is probably pretty important in the saliva for reducing nicotine levels. Because remember, salivary gland extracts have glucose oxidase in it, and glucose oxidase that I purified has glucose oxidase in it, obviously. But if you destroy that glucose oxidase, it no longer lowers the nicotine levels. Everybody see what I'm trying to say? And then here's the non-wounded plant. So this is, so actually the, the nicotine levels are at, so remember when I said constitutive, constitutive defenses? That means nicotine that's always present in the leaf. Non-wounded leaves and wounded leaves painted with salivary gland extract and glucose oxidase had equal levels of nicotine. See that right here, all three of these treatments? And if you paint it with water or paint it with autoclave glucose oxidase, the nicotine levels rise. So that provides some pretty good evidence now that, that this spit may be really doing something and it might likely be due to glucose oxidase. I even took this a step further. <clears throat> Let me show you, try to explain this graph to you. So we have four different treatments. We have water. We have salivary gland extracts with autoclaved glucose oxidase. And we have salivary gland extracts with active glucose oxidase. And then we have our non-wounded treatments. So what do we see with the water treatment and salivary gland extract with autoclave glucose oxidase? What do we see with the nicotine levels? Yeah, they rise up higher than if you treated salivary gland extracts with active glucose oxidase or the non-wounded treatment. So there is a significant difference. And we know it's statistically different. Here's our, we used, nine, we used 18 replicates. The p-value is less than 0 0.05. We used the ANOVA followed by Fisher's least significant difference test. And the standard error bars aren't overlapping. See these two overlap, see that? So the mean is somewhere in here about 95% confidence. These bars almost overlap and these definitely overlap. So remember I told you if the bars don't overlap, see this bar here and this bar here, there's no overlap. That gives me a good idea that it's statistically different. And then I did the statistical test on top of that. But this is just a way for you to casually look at data and understand what you're looking at. So I'm trying to give you. And the letters are different. Then we put little caterpillars on top of these leaves with and with, you know, after being wounded. 
and painted you know basically everything you see here. So we have water treatments, inactive glucose oxidase treatments, salivary gland extracts with active glucose oxidase, and non-wounded. So if the nicotine levels are higher here, and we put some caterpillars on it. Which ones do you think the caterpillars will do better on, and which ones do you think they'll do worse on? Well, obviously, if the nicotine levels are higher, the caterpillars should do worse here, right? Than over here. So let's look at what the survival rate was. These students are putting them on. And lo and behold, the percentage of survival, the survival is lower for tobacco plants treated with water or autoclaved glucose oxidase in comparison to the non wounded treatment or the plants wounded and treated with active glucose oxidase. I mean, it's like 20%, but it's still something and it's statistically significant. Does that make sense, everybody? So these, this is a perfect, I mean, this correlates well with what we saw here, right? High levels of nicotine, low levels of survival. Lower levels of nicotine, higher levels of survival. So that means that this is probably, could be important for the caterpillar that be making this enzyme, at least if they're feeding on tobacco plants. Not only that, so I guess going back to this chart, all we know is that nicotine is suppressed at this point. We don't really know what happens, but see, here's where the research never really ends. We don't know how these pathways are affected. All we know is nicotine suppressed. So you can now do the next experiment to see what happens to these different pathways. So it's, you know, it's just endlessly. You could, I mean, I could still be working on this right now. <laughs> Even if I try to work on every detail. We wanted to get at what byproducts were important. So this is nicotine and again in leaves, but this time we had water treatment, a non-wounded treatment, and then the two byproducts. What are these byproducts of again? Glucose oxidase, right? So we wanted to get at whether or not the byproducts were important. Hydrogen peroxide and gluconic acid are the byproducts of what enzyme? Glucose oxidase, right? So what happens is the hydrogen peroxide seems to be lowering the nicotine levels the most. So it seems like the byproduct of glucose oxidase and the production of hydrogen peroxide is probably having an effect on the, lowering the nicotine level. It's not just the enzyme, but the byproducts of the enzyme, hydrogen peroxide. There's evidence for that anyway. Does that make sense, everybody? I know I just jumped forward a little bit. Remember, the enzyme makes these byproducts our wounded plants with the byproducts, and they do lower the nicotine levels. Gluconic acid, hydrogen peroxide, both seem to lower it in comparison to water anyway. It's kind of, it's, a, it's probably a little bit more challenging because, you know, we have to figure out how much hydrogen peroxide to put on, and we're kind of guessing how much would be the right amount. But either way, these, product, these byproducts do seem to have an effect on nicotine levels in leaves. And then here's what we call Western blot. These students were going to measure the proteins in the tobacco leaves. And so they're putting them into a gel that'll then pull the samples through. And then we will do what we call Western blot, measure the proteins. And this was actually done by Dr. Hum, this part. And so we have our non wounded treatment, our water treatment, our salivary gland extract treatment, and our salivary gland extracts with glucose oxidase. Now I'm probably confusing you a little bit. What we're trying to measure is a pathogenous related protein. Okay. Doesn't really matter what it is other than what that uh, it symbolizes. It symbolizes that the plant pathogen response, remember the, when I talked at the very beginning, the system acquired resistance pathway is being turned on by caterpillar spit. Does everybody remember that slide? Salicylic acid, well, look, salivary gland extracts with active glucose oxidase stimulates pathogenous-related proteins in comparison to the other treatments. These are, these are, this was that gel 
that was stained with antibodies for um, the protein. Okay, it's laborious. It's kind of challenging. You got to have a, an antibody that sticks to the protein that has a dye on it. I don't know if you're familiar with Western blots at all, but that's what they were doing. So we're measuring one specific protein that the plant made as a result of it getting wounded and painted. And it seemed like the pathogenous related proteins are being stimulated because it has the biggest band, the biggest bar in comparison to the other treatments. So that gives, gives us evidence that this pathway is probably being turned on because of hydrogen peroxide and because of the plant pathogen proteins being turned on. Does that make sense, everybody? So caterpillar spit is turning, caterpillar spit in the byproduct hydrogen peroxide is probably turning on this pathway and suppressing nicotine. Now, I can't, you can't read this summary because of the slide, but this was the first time that insect saliva in situ had been shown to alter plant defenses. In situ means in life. And it was also the first time that any characterized insect-derived chemical had been shown to suppress induced herbivore defenses. You can't read it, but that's what it says. And it basically caterpillar spit suppresses nicotine and increases pathogenous-related proteins. And so this resulted in my first, first authored publication. And I happened to be fortunate enough to land it in arguably the top science journal. There's two or three top science journals. The British journal Nature is one of them. And so I was able to publish this in Nature as my first, first authored paper. So I basically hit a major home run on my first publication. It's one of these places that most people, in fact, I don't know if any, there's nobody else in the department other than Sue, who's a co-author, Dr. Hum, that was, this has a nature paper in this university, probably. <laughs> Definitely not in this department. There's some people that have some pretty high publications, like Dr. Meeker has one in Proceedings of National Science. Um, and then some people are very prolific scientists like Dr. Pierre. Um, but to get a super top journal, this is about as high, this is about as high as it goes. There's also the journal science and stuff. So I'd hit a home run right out of my PhD. So it was really cool for me anyway. All right. So what I have for you to read is this article. This is one of the articles you should read and summarize. It's only about a page or two long. And then there's two other articles that are directly related to this topic also that you'll read. So basically reading one almost allows you to read all three of them. Paying attention to what you heard tonight helps you to understand it. So if we go back to um, let's go back to the You know, the zoom mode. Okay, let's go back to this, uh, the article itself for a minute. So if we go to um, next, to the assignments that are going to be due to you, let's go to Western Online. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing the screen again for a second. This is basically me just telling you about your homework assignment. And then kind of give you ideas about how to read it. Can everybody see the screen okay? Jake, can you see the screen? Uh, yes, I can see it. Okay, so you can see Western Online is about to come up. Password in.
Okay, so go to plant animal interactions. You'll see your first assignment under assessment and assignments. Again, there's a lot of stuff here. Don't worry about everything on here at this point. All, the first thing you have to do is come to lecture one where the summary is misspelled. That says, welcome to the class. And this is not We double check. Oh, this isn't it. Sorry about that. Let's go back. Um, go to assessments again, assignments. And then it'll be um, summary first assignment. Okay. Does everybody see that? Jay, can you see that? Okay. Yes, I can see it. Okay. So then you click on it summary first assignment. And then, of course, this shows your names and stuff, and you'll value. Make sure you don't plagiarize. I, I'll try to make sure that I can turn on the feedback. But anyway, there are going to be the three articles underneath it. This is the nature paper. And again, I want you to. Actually, Oh, oh, it's because some people aren't research gate. Okay. Um, so if you go to this paper, um, you'll see the the spinneret. So just try to try to read some of it. Try to look at the pictures. I would start with this one. Here's the cauteri spinneret. We did it. We took pictures of it under electron microscope. And then here's the some of the slides that you saw tonight. You know, intact and ablated salivary glands and the weights of the caterpillars. It's a very short paper. It's about a page in this little bit here. And you can see the authors are right here. And then, so again, I'm trying to give you a strategy to try to read a little bit, look at the figures, read the legends of the figures. These are shortcuts that'll help you to understand what you're reading because it might be too tough if you just went straight through it. Maybe, I don't know, but that's what I would guess. <clears throat> so these are strategies for trying to read research papers. So here's another research paper. You know, read a little bit, try to read the abstract. It might be a little confusing. Read a little bit of the intro, maybe. And it's kind of go back and forth. Don't be thinking it's like reading a, a, a novel where you're just going from front to back. Then I go down, I look at the slides and I'll say, oh, okay, oh, look, here's that slide. What does it say? Salivary gland extracts with active glucose increase this gene or protein. We saw this in our presentation, right? Here's the weights of the caterpillars after feeding. Read that. And then that, and then that stuff usually makes the rest of it easier. So read a little bit, look at the figures, go back and forth a little bit. But I want you to try to understand what you're reading. Even if you don't read the whole thing, Try to get the gist of the story and focus on the figures. That'll give you 80, probably 70% of it. And then go back to the abstracts and stuff. You know, you probably should spend 30 minutes on a paper. In reality, to really absorb it, you might would rather probably spend a couple hours, right? So because of the background, you don't have that strong of a background. Even I would have to, you know, take a, you know, it can take a long time to read it if I was really reading it carefully. But try to read it enough to understand it. And so the approach is to be to look at the figures. And then once you get the gist of it, then you focus on papers that mean are more useful for you. Here's another one here. This talks about how the surgery technique was invented. And so we, we, I go into a lot of details about the surgeries and the cauterizations and stuff like that. And so basically the same kind of stuff. Okay. So anyway, I hope I'm giving you some ideas about what might seem challenging, how to break it down a little bit easier for yourselves. Look at figures, read abstracts, go back to the abstract, look at the figures, read a little bit of the methods of it when you, and try to just hit bits and pieces of it so it forms a picture a little bit. And then try to write a half page summary, which isn't very difficult. Oh, I don't know how difficult it is, but that's what I'm after, okay? And it's due in a week.
That doesn't mean it's the end of the world for you if you get a turn at me on Friday instead of Thursday. I'm not going to flunk any. I'm not that kind of guy. I got, we need people, we need students at Western so we don't close. <laughs> so I'm going to make sure you stick around. I'm just joking around, but yes. So did you want us to do half a page for each paper or just? That's the goal. Yeah. Yeah, that's the goal. Have a page. So it should be a page and a half that you can write over the, the three papers. Does that make sense, everybody? Um, again, I'm more after just, again, it's single space also. If you want to do double space, then it should be a page. It should be no more than 12 font. <laughs> I don't know how much we. <laughs> if you're running a little slow, we'll, you know, I'm not going to ding you if it ends up being on Saturday. You can just get her done. I've been known to collect papers even months after they were due, but I will take some points off this up. Anyway, you got me, it's all recorded. So now, you know, you got you can hold me to the fire. All right, thanks everyone. Drive carefully and I'll talk to you later. And this, and this recording will be available online. Hopefully you'll take notes of what you talked about because I do like you to write a half page summary of what you learned over today. I'll make a little note of that. Does that make sense, everybody? So did you take notes? <laughs> if not, you can watch the video again. Take care, everybody.